Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, it's such beautiful weather. So this is a terrific crowd, honestly, on a Saturday afternoon. And that all goes to show that um, these are the type of programs that you love and the people that we love to hear. I would, will let you know that tomorrow, in case you're around, we do have a chili cook-off. It's from one to three in that big old tent right there. And we have 16 chilies. It's a free event that you vote on. And so does the Traverse City Firefighters. Um, we have a some great local sponsors for some fantastic prizes, but honestly, it's just free lunch. So please come and enjoy. <laughs> Today, we get to listen to a couple of poets who I'm not a big poetry person. And I know people say that all the time, but man, working at the library is wonderful because you get to meet them up close and personal authors and poets. And it get, makes me be a fan or I am a fan because listening to authors and poets read their own work is the best. And, uh, that's just what I like to do, especially Teresa Scollin, who's done several and a couple other people in the audience here. So thank you and welcome very much. Uh, it sounds like it. Yeah. Can you hear me? And I think. Oh, OK. And the mic connects to Zoom. So this is being Zoomed at the same time. So. Fair warning, if you have a question, we'll be bringing this nice mic to you at some point. Thanks for coming. So Thomas Lynch is watching remotely, I think, and he likes to say that if poets are outnumbered, it's a successful reading. And we are very much outnumbered here today. <laughs> so I'd say it's a good, a good show on a nice day. Thanks for coming. So um, the plan here. Uh, is I'm going to, I'm Teresa Scullin. I'm going to read for maybe 20 minutes, Terry, about right. And then introduce Terry Blackhawk. I'm so glad to have Terry here. It's a rare treat to have her in this neck of the woods. Um, we have both recently been published by Alice Green and Company, which is a beautiful publisher uh, down in Ann Arbor. They focus on poetry that relates to its sustainability, um, poems about environment, they do beautiful work, make beautiful books. It's been really a, a privilege to be published by them. And so that we, we share a publisher, we share two publishers actually, um, Wayne State University Press, which also makes beautiful books and Alice Green. So that was the reason for concocting this program today. So um, I'll begin with a quick thank you, but I'll intersperse thank yous. Um, throughout, but thanks to Traverse Area District Library. Um, when I launched my book, it was still a bit covid -y out there, and so we launched it virtually, um, but it's really great to have this resource in town and in the area. So um, I'm kind of debating about um, which poem to read first. Uh, if I I have one upsetting poem and does that go in the middle or does it go at the beginning or does it go at the end? <laughs> so maybe I'll start out with it. Uh, and that's um, the news coming out of Ukraine is extremely disturbing. Um, and this poem was written uh, in February when things just started to, to happen there. Meanwhile, meanwhile, bombs fall on Ukraine shattering everything carefully made, frightening the animals, turning parents into cloaks over children. The old flee on the backs of younger men, picking their way across broken bridges. Once they sat in quiet houses. They gazed out polished windows at trees and birds, watched for spring. Outside my window, the white, the white pine grows a foot every year, it was taken from the woods by a friend who saw it hemmed in and struggling. Now it grows fat and round. Once I found a baby robin deep in its branches, stashed there by a watchful parent while she foraged. We shelter each other. Where we are planted is pure chance. For all we know, the trees of Ukraine, who have no shelter, who appear in photos halved beheaded, scorched, and jagged, are crying out, their voices carried by westerly winds all the way round the world. For all I know, the trees I live under 
Feel tremors through their toes in the earth, shudder for distant sisters. For all I know, their rising sap catches in the riverine throats. Um, actually, we share a third publisher here, which is Nimrod. Yeah, so that poem appeared in Nimrod. Uh, they are from the University of Tulsa, and it's a nice magazine. So here's a happier poem. How's that? Uh, and this is an ode, which is a poem of praise, um, written for the vaccine, the M RNA vaccine. Stolen code. By now the instructions have been destroyed, dissolved and dumped with the trash, as in any spy story. The ribonucleic messengers expelled in the nanoballs of lipids they slid around in, and good riddance. They were greasy company, but useful. By now the cells have all assembled their spikes, like the cruel gutter spikes that discourage pigeons, who by another name are the doves of peace. Easy for me to talk of peace when my role is merely ceremonial, parasitical, swanning around above the neck while the city-state of the body prepares for siege. We are creatures of war meant to survive, committed right down to the cell. I am allowed to think what I like, to siphon energy, to pretend I know what's going on, to write odes. It's nice to see everybody here and all you invisible people out there in uh, virtual land. So this is the book. Is that, am I holding that up correctly? And they did a beautiful job, Trees and Other Creatures. I am of the belief that trees are creatures. And um, let me just say a thank you to Alice Green and company, which is shepherded by Jill Peak, who makes beautiful work. And I also want to thank um, Tom Lynch, who um, was good enough to give me some time to work in Ireland in his family cottage in Kilkee, near Kilkee in County Clare. And when I was staying there, um, pre-COVID, the year escapes me, uh, there was a calf in the backyard, an orphaned calf who became my buddy. And it's quite windy there. Um, so this comes out of that experience, could be. The orphaned calf stands quite still. He thinks he is a bird. He thinks he is a flower. He has lowered his lashes to listen to his friend, the wind, which whispers he could float, he could fly. He lets the sun press him into the ground with the miraculous grass. The cattle across the road are nearby music. Closer, the electric rattle of birds who launch and hover. He is the only child of this paddock. The wind lays its hand on him, on us, pushes and insists. I am cradled by the wind. I think I am calf, wind, bird. I think I am a flower. How are we doing? Okay. So <clears throat> Fleeta Brown, who's here today, once read this next poem and concluded, we really don't know what we're doing here, <laughs> which, and I agree. So I'll start there um, or I'll read this one. So this is an ekphrastic poem which means it's written in response to a piece of art. Uh, this one is written after American Gothic, that famous painting by Grant Wood, where you see two people in front of a farmhouse, one's holding a pitchfork and one's looking concerned. And I was thinking about the woman who's looking concerned. This is called A Wonder. A wonder the way the chickens come running as soon as they seen us like they was looking for advice from something taller and wiser, which we was. But isn't it a wonder how chickens know that? 
They were likely anxious, the clouds and the dark coming on. They wanted supper and their roost, and they wanted us to usher them in. While they muttered and cooed, each one worrying over itself and full of comment. After they were settled, I looked at ourselves standing here, the light of the evening glowing on his clean shirt, and everything arranged and weeded and trimmed and straight edged as if we knew what we was doing, or like somebody had set us down in our own pen, as if a day spent on the straight and narrow was all there was, and I wondered. Maybe two more. Does that sound about right? More of Terry's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so give me the, you know, when it's ready. Okay. So um, there's some Traverse City area residents here. Um, you remember the storm in, was it 2015 when we had these straight line winds uh, that blew just hundreds of trees over? maybe more than hundreds, um, but it was, it was really terrible. And it was kind of this unspoken grief for a while until I heard um, Karen Anderson read a poem. And I thought, that's right, um, this is real. This is real grief. So this is called After the Storm. It was as if the earth had opened its lungs on the ground before us. A rainforest with its dimmed and radiant air, broken branches like wrecked cities, entire worlds of leaves still green and glossy, new acorns snug as young on an animal's back, the blued air filled with breathing. The people were still in their burrows of wood and plastic and glass, lightning, sorry, lightning needled the distance, and the leaves leaves, each individual set of crisp edges and generous green. It was as when a fish landed in the boat, all its tiny scales flashing while it gasps, is never more alive, is never more beautiful in its color and detail. And the branches flashed white in the darkness where they were torn, and for days after the traffic had resumed, and the morning dove had again taken up its unhurried notes. The leaves and branches of the trees, trimmed and piled chest high along the curb for disposal, kept living. Am I, can you still hear me? Is it, am I speaking? Okay, great. I want to also um, just kind of take a quick thank you break to community. So there are people here from Michigan Writers. There, there's a fiction writer. There's another poet. Um, and there's another poet. And I think this um, poet I just met is probably part of a writing community. And just say thank you in general to all of you who help us keep going and listening as well. How about one more, Terry, and then you're on? Okay. Um, I feel like we need to have another tree poem in here or maybe a turtle poem. The snapper. <laughs> Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, the snapper. In the long green days of summer, my grandfather caught a snapping turtle, turtle whose feet were as big as his hands. He stowed it in a heavy crock by the door, littered with a thick plate and heavy stone, and went to bed dreaming of soup. In the morning, the crock was empty under its plate and stone. The turtle was gone. For all we know, it's living still, all weight and plate and cutting beak, trudging again the slick bottoms or lying under the mud in the pond, snaking its long neck up like a snorkel, caught by its relentless nature and freed also. Think of it, encased in that ceramic tomb, 
just another egg to break out of, maybe. The same scrabble up slippery sides, the same imperative. The weight of the lid on its back, moving backwards along the carapace, tipping as the turtle clambered up and out, clattering back into place over emptiness, while the turtle, who survived the dinosaurs, the meteorite and nuclear winter, my grandfather's dinner plans, that long moment when you're caught and held by the wicked and the bad, hope sealed off, when you are meant to only wait and tremble. The turtle worked its slow magic, move, move against the heavy dark. Thank you. So I want to introduce Terry Blackhawk to you. Um, I was in a conversation the other day in which someone said, poets are extremely dangerous company um, because we are the unacknowledged legislators of culture. If that's so, and I kind of hope it is, um, if that's so, then you can't do much better than Terry Blackhawk, I don't think. Um, she is an accomplished poet and also an accomplished educator, a person of great vision. As a teacher, she noticed uh, in Detroit Public Schools, she noticed how kids responded when there was a writer in the room. And in 1995, um, she founded Inside Out Literary Arts Project in Detroit, which is still going strong. Um, one of the most prestigious, largest, oldest um, literary arts organizations in the Detroit area, and it takes writers into the schools. Um, she received a National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award in 2009 for that um, project. Um, she began writing in her 40s, is that correct? Um, she's published, she's uh, well published. Um, what she's going to read from today is her fourth chapbook. Uh, she also has five full length collections. And she also co-edited an anthology of essays about the Inside Out um, Literary Arts Project. Um, she, I first think, I think I first crossed paths with Terry uh, at Wayne State University Press launch. And um, I don't know if she'll read it today, but I first, you should look up her poem about Billy Collins. It features striped pajamas uh, and a good sense of humor. Terry's uh, a poet of great range. I think you'll enjoy her very much. And thank you for coming up all this way. Hello. Thank you for everybody for coming out. And thank you so much, Teresa. It's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm looking forward also to visiting Teresa's classes on Monday. So this is a kind of a full circle kind of uh, trip for me. And thank you, Be Betsy, for um, all the support from the library and my family, my niece, my brother, my sister are all here. So we have uh, uh, the Bond Horse row in the back. <laughs> thank you all for coming out. Um, and I uh, just finished reading Teresa's um, Trees and Other Creatures, and it's just so, I don't know, breathtaking. It's, it's a very calm and very insightful book. And I wanted to share with you what Tom Lynch wrote about it. Um, of all the forms of life and animations, goldfinches, service berries, zinnias, and dung beetles, if you let Ms. Scollin's genial, genial subversive scrutiny I just love that phrase, become a way of seeing things, the holy and the holy ordinary are forever twined and bathed in bergamo and tonic light. Take this brief book in grateful savory doses. So five stars and thank you, Tom Lynch. Um, and it's so wonderful to share um, Alice Green. Uh, I was such an honor to have them uh, take my little small manuscript here. Um, Mommy, Mommy is um, an elegiac collection of poems uh, to my late life love, Neil Frankenhauser, who was an artist in Toledo. 
and we met online after I had a long marriage had gone south and we had um, many, many wonderful times together. And so this will get you, I guess you can get to know Neil a little bit through this book. I call it Mommy, Mommy. The Mommy River flows through Toledo and widens and opens out into Lake Erie. And Neil was a plein air painter. And um, in addition to painting industrial relics, the uh, abandoned industrial structures of Toledo, he he called the mommy his sacred river and he would go there all the time and he left behind hundreds of beautiful watercolors and one of those is on the cover of this book and they did it i loved how they incorporated in black and white inside some of his images as well so here's the first poem mommy mommy oh and i and i found this epigraph from Lori Anderson, the purpose of death is the release of love. The first poem is Visitation. Hello, Swallowtail. Hello, companion. Two days dallying. Is that enough? We both know these flowers will not last. Hello, fog. Hello, rain. Hello, simplicity. Do stop in. I haven't tried your ladder in a while. Is this bucket still there? You know, the blue one. I'm going to sit right here on this patch of lawn, cupping my hands until something lands or speaks. Hello, dear meddler. You mentioned the news stopped by. Tell me everything. This poem is called In Duple Time. Chart us on the radio, bows strike strings, and I learned Tchaikovsky's pledge, 12 scenes, one per month, was not in homage to his muse, but a job, a chore, so unlike your plein air duty to your river, where floods have subsided and ice scarred the bank across the shore. Write a poem about you? Amore, I started to say, you can't order a poem, as if no poem exists without you now, and the hours don't say only your name. Chart us, a Hungarian tune in a minor key. I discover it's a wedding dance after you are gone. The couple starts slowly, then in duple time, ends with a rapid whirl. Put those shadows in your painting, darling. Must we live twice in order to love once? I have a lot of, of Neil's art in my home and this is a, a painting. He actually got a little fed up, I think with a piece of art I had in my bedroom in Lafayette Park and one day and he just moved it out and he brought this in and <laughs> I really love it. Um, and this is actually the first poem I wrote uh, of this whole sequence about him. Of course. Of course you are not here, but you left me these tilted telephone poles from the 1920s, a car I can almost see, and a triangular warning sign in bright red contrast to the deep ochre and cobalt shadows crossing the center line of the road. It could be the way your dusky trees in the background swell against the horizon, amorphous there beyond the vanishing point, which is, of course, where you are now, or almost, on the verge of taking your last breath. But this road you gave me led me into sleep so often, I'll go down it now, keeping track, and of course, also not. This garage on the right, I could pull into it on an ordinary day, find perhaps a path alongside and a bungalow a few paces ahead, its porch half hidden by bushes. I'll meet you there. Uh, to go to a gallery with Neil was extraordinary. Um, this is called at the National Gallery of Art Memorial View, which happily was in the Dunes Review recently. 
To reach the Rothkos, climb four flights up past the calder floating in light from windows angled above the terrazzo staircase, marble bright, marble light, trilobites and shells embedded underfoot, and on I go, my river's shores opening out. I've passed the bellows you loved, Huey Lee Smith's ghetto flute ascending. First stop, Magritte, a curtained emptiness. Next, Max Ernst's moment of calm belies its name with the textural busyness you'd have defied these new motion sensors to peer into. I imagine you imbibing this forest of drowned roller coasters, graffito birds, bristlecone pines, collapsible cups uncollapsing upward. You always did like to come nose close. In my wallet, a profile cut out, you hands thrust in your painting smock, face tilting up, lips puckered for a kiss. The photo just one of many surprises you tuck into a pocket or sock drawer before driving back to Toledo. You may never find this, you wrote on one, but I hope it brings you joy if you do. So when I arrive at the Rothko's and start writing and a stranger interrupts to let me, to tell me I'm his muse, I startled. He is so not you, yet I go on into the not you. Blab about Twombly, art pilgrimages, but why talk to him at all? I sought a chapel, not this. The black square floats inside the maroon, the red above the white. None, all of it is still. Sun Hat, Cape Cod photo number one. Here you are squinting out from the straw hat we bought at the stop and save. And here I am, uncut, hair shaggier than my dogs, its fringe a hinge of memory. And what's a photo, but a mirror, one where I see you still seeing me and meet again in your gaze, the woman I was the night we met, strangers just in from the rain. Yellow tornado tree. Not like Monet with his lilies and cool surfaces, but your hazel eyes gazing into mine. M watched his wife's skin change color as breath left her body. Close to the end now, you tell me, don't make too much of your hazel eyes gazing into mine, but I yearn regardless for nuance and touch. Close to the end now, you tell me, don't make too much of how much of life has passed us by, but I yearn regardless for nuance and touch. I recall your joy at your yellow tornado tree, not how much of life has passed us by. All I ever wanted, you told me, our lives lived as one. How you laughed when you named it, yellow tornado tree, with colors like swallows cascading up. All I ever wanted, you told me, our lives lived as one. I will never forget your surprise at how the yellows like swallows came cascading up. Monet inspected Camille's skin as breath left her body. I hold it close still, your wild surprise, not like Monet with his lilies and cool surfaces. Early Elegy. Of course I know it's time to come to terms. You are ash, memory, the grit and grain we scattered from your painting spot onto the surface of your beloved river not far from that small historic house we came close to buying. Where I live now, I sit and look out from a three-season porch, much like the one you admired in Mommy. You saw yourself making art there, grateful for northern light from the uncurtained windows. And sometimes I see you here, busy or laughing, doing crosswords or finding new angles to sketch among the rooftops and flower pots making ordinary days as ordinary people who love one another are wont to do, speculating about the breeze or the sky.
how you left. I saw the hairy woodpecker with its oddly yellow crown, a bullfrog on the far side of lily pads gleaming in the sun, its throat a small balloon. And there were children beside us peering into the woodland scene. You gave each bird its one assignment, this one scratching, that one peck pecking, and then just like that, they were gone. Not as if a door opened or a human had walked out into the feeder area. Rather, it was circular. Some vortex had sucked them up. I thought, water spout, whirlwind. It got still. Then the hawk cried, stretched wide its wings, and landed. This is a little longer. This is a kind of a prose poem. So here, and has an epigraph from Alan Shapiro. You, by being dead, are more alive to me than ever. So here I've gone and reframed your painting, the one of the street with its tilted telephone poles, the street that led me into sleep so often, now bordered by an eggplant purple, very trendy and advised by the decorator to pick up the purples and greens of other pieces in my room, but it limits it now, limits you. It's as if you are truly framed, captured, gone with and within this frame. I should have chosen a lighter color, a chalky off-white, something to move the out eye outward, not this dark lock. I still get lost in that street the way I got lost in the exhibit of Plains Indian Ledger art yesterday, brought up short by the bounding buffalo and Sundance memories painted by Bear's heart, shorn of his hair, imprisoned in a fort in Florida, and then the blue-clad troops marching his Cheyenne into a stockade, the warriors standing stiff, two-dimensional against the gridded paper, heading into an unthinkable dark. Oh, everywhere is doom and beauty, ache and ruin. So it almost wasn't strange the way your friend came up to me, surprised me in the act of looking, and brought you, as always, with him. Your van, a lifetime of friendship and art, and you there within it. Your paintings live with me, bring me your voice, your antic laugh, your wry, sly glances up from the surfaces of them. There you are, working at your easel in the corner of your studio, its tilted frame in your lap. And there I am, sitting in a chair across the room, lifting my skirt. Sometimes I think of us as children together, our stories intertwine. You were five, a young Diego, filling your father's freshly painted wall, your crayons recreating the house fire from across the street, a red chaos billowing. I was seven when the teacher spoke to me sharply, so I turned over my paper and drew my home, the rocky drive, the house surrounded by woods, the slender pines that had fallen from snow and crossed my path so I could ride them like the horses I dreamed at night, the black one, the white one, flying me out into sleep among the stars. Maybe two or three more. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, this one is called Telling Time. And it has an ep epigraph. Time rattles at our window. Time trying to get in. You told time by the sun when you worked on plein air. You were your own challenger then, Neil, adhering to your set up rituals, the unzippering of the case of oil pastels, the unfolding of the easel, the tying it to a filled gallon jug, lest wind pick up by the side of the road, or else by the bridge over the Maumee there in Sidecut Park off the main highway, after balancing the board on your lap, you'd stake out hours on the bench on the bank to let the current or the leaves or your divine selfishness lead you, the sharpening light of evening always best. I could climb that, the young woman announced after she pulled off the road to, to take in the smokestack of the abandoned Acme steam plant rising magenta and orange from your canvas. So now I know no place is too incongruous for love or sex, how the relentless rust of this region, its nuclear plant slag heaps, piles of salt, 
dotting the industrial corridor between our towns could be worthy of love. It was all you ever wanted, you told me, in the mauve twilight of the nursing home, where I rushed every blessed chance I could. And when draw was all you could say, you took the marker from me and moved it in permanent black lines across the white board. And what started as a star became a compass, a clock, something to parse a lifetime with, a mechanical flower that would collapse and devour you at last, alone and afraid, and me not there beside you. A Blessing of Scallops, Eastern Market, Detroit. And this has this epigraph from Derek Walcott. Sit, feast on your life. Succulent pillows of salt and sea, flesh dollops scooped from glistening shells lined across the seafood company's bed of ice. Can they tell me how waves know when to stop cresting? If I walk alone through a midnight graveyard, Will my bones remain the same? Maybe Brother Nature, with his purslane arugula and nasturtiums, can explain why the fox trotted through my yard in the middle of yesterday, or why the pie guy in the next stall never seems to see me, even when I buy his apples or admire his gooseberry pies. Cheese shop, wine shop, backpack I stuff my groceries in before crossing Gratiot and making my way through the park and home to my love or wood, except now I've moved far away and the market is locked down, while across the planet Venice has canceled its yearly wedding with the sea. No rings to toss to the waves now, so why do I hear your voice in my dreams and why did you call me in the middle of the night? months after you had died. Dead? He is dead, I told the 2 a.m. voice on the line, even though I had just seen you sitting at my table, watching me whisk a sauce for our scallops, pen in your pocket protector, your shirt sleeves rolled loosely above your finely boned wrists. And uh, Neil was never without his pocket protector. And this is the last poem in the book. And one of the things they did so beautifully is they included some black and white images from his portfolio. So this is the next, this is the image that comes after that poem I just read. Or close to it. This is the last poem in the book. And um, it quotes from Ovid's Metamorphoses and also quotes from a letter of consolation by Abraham Lincoln. I won't even do that. You'll just have to kind of figure out and hear it. I'm not going to do little air quotes. All right. It's called, this is Sonny Rollins and the Redemptive Handrail. I keep on not knowing, and I cling to that like a redemptive handrail. Vishwava Jamborska. Take it, one note at a time, your breath the only constant, except for there where sparrows drop below the line of the roof or where the rime-crusted grass you crunched over creates a little whine up your spine. Oh, I want to be able to bear this. I've tried to, to let it push out endlessly the way a gong once sounded sends ripples into the universe that never stop. Meanwhile, one breath then another, mute then open, mull then recall, paths, canvases, landscapes turned inside out, sun-bleached branches whitened against a black sky, slow pulsing, slow, slow, darling, I loved you once, the sax's moan reminds, how down the sloping lawn or across the icy walk we held each other, grief's hushed joy now of a purer, holier sort, this sad, sweet feeling in the heart. Still waiting love's amber arpeggios, I hear one chord's tingle replace the next, then back, liquid tremolo rampant here, vibrating nowhere's edge. And I keep on not knowing, 
cannot say hand, dog, boot, or glove, outside or beyond, only wonder if the moment cannot contain more sun than this. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. Thank you, Teresa. or anything like that, but if anyone wants to ask some questions, you can. You just have to use a microphone. <laughs> or you can just mingle and talk. I did want to let you know about another program that we have coming up on the 27th with uh, Fred Carlisle, who has had a love affair with Lake Michigan for a while, and he wrote about it. And we have a special guest of Anne Ingram also, who's going to be there. And that's at 6.30. Here. 